So I just wanted to begin by saying hello to everyone. Welcome to this sample class at Syracuse University. Uh, I want to begin by welcoming you to Syracuse uh, if you're recently admitted, um, or I know some folks might be prospective applicants. And I hope that we'll have the occasion to meet in the years to come if you end up taking classes in um, in the art history department. So my name is Professor Maggie Ennis, and I teach art history here at Syracuse in the Department of Art and Music Histories, which is in the College of Arts and Sciences. And I specialize in the history of photography. Um, this is a really interesting subset of art history um, of the last 200 years or so. And you know, now we all have cameras and uh, we're totally uh, habituated to seeing photographs everywhere we go. And if you have a cell phone, you probably also have a camera and you probably take photographs on a daily basis. Um, but it hasn't always been this way. And in fact, photography wasn't invented until the mid 19th century, like around 1839 or so. Um, so it hasn't been around for that long, if we're thinking about the broad scope of history. Um, and, and in this brief time period, it's dramatically changed how we look at each other, how we represent each other, and how we think about and interact with our world. Um, so these are the kinds of questions and dynamics that we think about in the history of photography, which includes the way that artists have used photographs to reimagine what art can be, right? Um, it also includes vernacular, popular forms of photography um, practiced by folks like you and me, like in snapshot photography, family photography. And it also includes the way that photography is related to larger structures, social structures, social processes, like colonization and imperial expansion um, and decolonial practices, protest photography, things like this. So dynamics of power and, and protest and resistance as well. So it's a really rich field. And obviously I'm biased, but it's, but it's my favorite kind of thing to talk about. Um, and it's a really fascinating subset of visual history. Um, so this semester, I'm actually teaching an undergrad course on contemporary photography. And this class looks at the way artistic and popular practices of the last 50 years or so, right, since the 1970s have changed, um, continuing all the way into the present. Uh, and this includes technological changes like the shift from analog to digital camera technology, which probably happened a little bit before y'all were born. Um, but, but that was something that um, made a big impression on me when I was your age. Um, but it also includes artistic developments and the ways that ideas about photography, ideas about what photography is and how it works have also changed pretty dramatically in, in this short 50 year time frame. Um, and today I'm going to share some material from this course that seems increasingly topical, especially as we talk about chat GPT and all that kind of stuff, artificial intelligence. Um, today, I'm gonna to talk about the relationship between photography and surveillance. Um, this is maybe something we've thought about in passing, but, um, but haven't really interrogated this relationship in much depth. Um, when we think about surveillance, maybe the first associations that come to mind are dramatic, or sinister, right? We might think about um, secret government operations or spy movies or other kinds of pop culture um, treatments of this issue of surveillance. Um, we might also think about the kind of alarmist articles we see in the paper about um, artificial intelligence and, and the kind of incursions into private life that this kind of technology is making. Um, but the truth is, that we're surrounded by many different kinds of surveillance, right, in our everyday lives. Um, and many of these forms of surveillance use photography. So photographic documentation is a basic feature of many legal and institutional documents, for instance. And you see some examples of that on your screen here. Um, if you've ever been photographed for a passport or a school ID or for your driver's license, then you've encountered this kind of photographic documentation. And these forms of documentation and identification, they're kind of double-edged. 
Because on the one hand, they entitle us to certain rights and privileges in the society that we live in. They allow us to prove who we are and gain access to places and things, right? Um, but on the other hand, they also allow others to identify you. And this uh, dynamic is where the idea of surveillance comes in. Now, the term surveillance is old. It comes from um, Latin and French, from the Latin vigilare, which means to keep watch, and from the French surveiller, which literally means to watch over. So this idea of surveillance um, and the way we think about surveillance now is actually pretty recent. It, it dates to the late 18th century to a certain kind of architectural model that you see pictured here, which is called the panopticon. And the panopticon, it's become a much broader concept in, in popular usage and theory. But originally, the panopticon was a prison design that was invented by an English philosopher named Jeremy Bentham. And Bentham was a jurist and a political reformer who was really interested in penal law and punishment and coming up with more efficient ways to punish people um, and, and, you know, establish um, modes of control for criminals. And he designed a kind of prison that he called the Panopticon that was meant to be ultra efficient. It was going to be a kind of optimal prison design um, that had a very special inbuilt system of control. And this system of control had to do with the shape of the prison. As you can see in this little historical postcard, the prison was circular in design. Um, and so the prisoner's cells were distributed around the perimeter of this circular prison design. And there was a single watch guard tower right in the middle. And with this design, Bentham essentially created a space where the prison guards could literally watch over, literally surveil all of the prisoners, while the prisoners would be completely unable to see the guard. So this produced an asymmetrical, a one-sided situation, right, um, where the guards had the privileged perspective where they could see the, the prisoners without being seen in return. And this privileged perspective gave them power. So it's this dynamic of one way looking, this ability to watch without being seen in return that becomes the dynamic that we associate um, and theorize about um, modern surveillance. Now, historically, Photography intersects with surveillance in really interesting ways, because sort of like the panopticon, the camera is also a device of one way looking, right? Because when we stand behind our cameras, we're also the ones looking out and constructing our view of the world. So here I'm showing you a little caricature, a cartoon from the 19th century that actually shows a, a prisoner being photographed by a professional photographer and he's being watched over by the prison guard. Um, so you kind of get the sense of, of the camera serving as a kind of panopticon in this image. But photography's relationship to surveillance becomes even more explicit in the late 19th century. Um, in France, um, when a French policeman and criminologist named Alphonse Bertillon invented the form of representation that we're all now very familiar with as the mugshot. And Bertillon was really the first person to develop a photographic system for identifying criminals. And as you can see here in this early um, mugshot produced by Bertillon, this system used photographs to make very detailed records of each criminal's face, which were then put together with little cards that listed their body measurements and other identifying features. And then these two documents, the photograph and the body measurements, would be put together and stored together in the police archives, and they'd be used to identify the criminals if they were ever arrested again. And they eventually produced this comprehensive photographic archive of criminals in the Paris um, police records. So with the mugshot, Bertillon comes up with this new use for photography, 
um, which isn't predetermined when the medium is invented in 1839, right? Um, it's something that comes into use over the course of the 19th century. But, but in this respect, by this time period, right, by the late 19th century, photography has become closely linked to surveillance and, and forms of early forms, um, pre-digital forms of facial recognition technology. So this is a kind of prehistory of biometrics and photographic surveillance. Um, because it's helpful to understand what came before, um, to understand what's happening now. So when we jump forward to today, what we find is that photography's use in facial recognition technology has just multiplied. It's proliferated on the internet in ways that might not seem especially noteworthy to us in our day-to-day -day lives, but that remain very closely tied to surveillance and, and the way that surveillance has evolved in our own moment. For example, in 2014, Mark Zuckerberg's company Facebook, which is now known as Meta, of course, um, announced that it had developed a program called DeepFace. And DeepFace was able to identify faces with 97% accuracy, which is a really crazy statistic. Um, this 97% accuracy rate means that statistically speaking, this program DeepFace could actually identify faces um, almost as efficiently as actual human subjects. So this program that again was developed in 2014 had a kind of uh, eerie human-like capacity to recognize faces in, in images. Now to get this high level of accuracy, researchers had to train the program. They had to feed it photographs to get it to learn how to recognize faces. And, and the faces that they fed the program were called data sets. Now, data sets are essentially huge pools of photographs that get um, put into the program to teach it how to recognize faces. So it gets one photograph after another, 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 and over time it learns how to recognize these facial patterns. And DeepFace at the time was trained on the largest facial data set of that moment. Um, it was fed over 4 million photographs of faces of over 4,000 people. So this is a, a huge um, data set that it's working with. Now, at first glance, this, this might seem harmless enough. Um, Facebook used this technology uh, to do things that seemed helpful um, and efficient. It, it would automatically recognize people in photos. It would suggest tags for images, so it would make the process of tagging faster. Um, and it would generate all text, alternative text for um, visually impaired users. So these are good things in, in a way, right? But from a critical perspective and for critics of facial recognition technology, this program, DeepFace, it, it also raised serious concerns about the ways that corporations like Facebook could use artificial intelligence and facial recognition to violate users' privacy, to um, you know, create forms of targeted advertising, which is something that's geared toward profit, right? Um, and also more generally, the way Facebook might use facial recognition for surveillance um, in ways that could be sold or shared with other corporations or other entities. And we see these kinds of invasive and weaponized uses of facial recognition, this kind of worst case scenario that critics were um, concerned about in another company uh, called Clearview AI, which was founded in 2017. Now, unlike DeepFace, which was part of Facebook, um, Clearview AI was uh, conceived as a kind of standalone facial recognition system uh, that could be rented out for profit, right? It was a, it's a private um, corporation, private company um, that would collect images of people's faces from across the whole internet. So this is essentially an image scraping um, program that will just reach out into every corner of the internet every image that's posted on every website and scrape these images of people's faces for purposes of um, facial recognition. So this means that any photograph of you on the internet, whether it's on a school website or YouTube or Instagram can be scraped from the web and used to identify you. Um, and for years now, Clearview AI has been selling this technology 
to all kinds of um, private businesses, um, also police departments, to uh, governments, to private companies, and even to universities for purposes of security and law enforcement. And the last time I checked, um, Clearview AI had over 2,000 clients. So um, this is a, a program that's, that's in use um, today. Now, again, this expanded field of surveillance means that all kinds of photos that have never been intended for purposes of surveillance or control, right, they become data, they become part of these um, images that can be scraped and used to identify and track people. So the photographs taken of us by security cameras when we drive on the street or when we go to the store, photographs taken of us by other people when we're just out and about, or even the photos of ourselves and our, our friends that we might upload to sites like Instagram. These all become scrapable, searchable um, by programs like Clearview AI. So this raises a question, and it raises a question that a lot of contemporary artists have been thinking about. Photography, for much of its history, has been really closely linked to forms of surveillance, right? To forms of um, power and, and control. But the question that artists have asked in recent years is, can photography be used to subvert or resist or challenge these forms of surveillance? So um, I want to share a few artistic practices um, that take up this question with you now as a, as a kind of way to think about some of the broader uh, social potentials of art. Here you're seeing the artists Kate Crawford and Trevor Paglin, who are two very interesting uh, thinkers who have been making work that looks at the way photographic data sets are made and, and looks at the way these data sets are used to train facial recognition systems. And Crawford and Paglin actually developed a project that analyzed one data set in particular. This is one of the largest and most influential um, image training sets, which was called ImageNet. And this was a database that was first developed in 2009. Um, and it contains over 14 million labeled images that have been used to train programs um, like DeepFace, right? Train these facial recognition programs to identify objects in images. So Crawford and Palin, um, they wanted to analyze and draw attention to the implicit bias within these labeling systems. So they created their own web-based program, which they called ImageNet Roulette. So you're playing roulette with images. Um, and it allowed users to upload a picture of their face or any other picture that they might want to um, to ImageNet Roulette. And then ImageNet Roulette would run the algorithm the, that it had been trained on using these data sets on the image. And then it would generate identification labels, the same kind of identification labels that are so important for uh, facial recognition technology as well. Um, so you could upload a picture of yourself, press the go button, and you'd get back uh, the kinds of labels that the, the algorithm was producing about you. And you can see an example of how ImageNet Roulette works in this sample image of characters from The Wizard of Oz, um, which produces a, an array of surprising labels for these um, familiar cultural uh, characters, right? So we see that the scarecrow is labeled as being in whiteface. Um, the lion is a fauve, which is a French term uh, and also a painting movement, meaning wild or primitive. Dorothy is somehow labeled as the queen mother and the Tin Man is an astronaut, a spaceman, a cosmonaut. So these are not terms that we might ourselves uh, associate with these movie characters, right? But based on the appearance of their face, these are the character characterizations that the program is generating for them. Now, when ImageNet Roulette first debuted, it went viral because as you can imagine, playing with images in this way is a lot of fun. And also some of the labels you get are just really outlandish. Um, so it went viral on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, um, all kinds of people were posting the results of their own image analyses um, on social media sites. And what people very quickly discovered as they began sharing these images was that the labels that were attached to the training set, the labels that these their pictures would generate had implicit biases, 
right? Um, and these implicit biases had been encoded into the program by human programmers. And um, we see a most egregious example of this um, in, uh, in this comparison here. Um, many Black users of ImageNet Roulette very quickly noticed that, well, white users, um, when they would upload pictures of their face, they, they generate a variety of professional or positive labels, like this white man on the right who's, who's been labeled as a sociologist. But in many instances, the only result that the program returned for Black people was that they were Black. So this isn't a product of the objectivity of, of AI, right? This is a reflection of the fact that AI is produced by people, people with biases who reproduce their biases as they train algorithms to produce certain responses. And this is precisely the dynamic that Paglin and Crawford we're try, trying to draw people's attention to with the project ImageNet Roulette, right? Because even though AI is associated with objectivity, we think of it as a kind of totally um, automated, machine-generated sort of thing, it's programmed by humans who reproduce their prejudices and biases within technology. So Crawford and Paglin used ImageNet Roulette to draw public attention to this phenomenon. And the virality of, um, of the program was, was part of this, uh, part of this uh, consciousness raising. On the other hand, we see a very different sort of visual approach to facial recognition technology um, in the work of artist Adam Harvey, who developed an app um, that he called DeFace. This is a little bit of a pun because to deface something is to muck it up or, or destroy it or you know um, graffiti it or something. But to deface also means to, in a, in a literal way, it means to remove one's face, right? So um, this app that Harvey developed, Deface, it, it used facial recognition technology, um, but it used the facial recognition technology to create a program that would actually remove faces from photographs which you can see in this um, example of, of the D, how the DeFace app works. So Harvey conceived of this project specifically for activists and social media users to allow them to remove their faces before posting them to the web. So this would essentially make these images unreadable by other facial recognition technology. So Harvey is using facial recognition technology to subvert facial recognition technology with this project. Now, the last artist I want to introduce you to um, who is thinking about um, modern surveillance technology is the Bangladeshi American artist, Hazan Alahi, um, whose work you see here. Now, Alahi is uh, a really interesting and important figure because at around the turn of this century, um, after 2001, Alahi was mistakenly added to the U.S. government's watch list. This was after 9-11, when a lot of Muslim Americans were being unfairly targeted on um, racial grounds. And Alahi was placed on the watch list, and he realized that he was being surveilled by the government. And as a kind of critical artistic response, he actually began to surveil himself. He began a project where he would digitally track himself and record his own daily activities, which he then posted on the internet. Um, so as part of this project, which he called Tracking Transients, Elahi took over a hundred pictures a day. He was just constantly photographing himself and everything he did. He documented his meals, um, his errands, trips to the shopping, um, to the grocery store, personal encounters every time he went to the bathroom. Um, and he would upload all of these images to his website for anyone to see. Now, as you see in this detail from, from the grocery store, it looks like we're in the produce aisle, right? Um, these are really boring pictures. These are not highly refined um, aesthetic documents that we would spend uh, hours uh, contemplating, right? Um, and, and there are so many of them that they actually become very difficult to process in any detail. You're seeing an, an example here from, from a Sunday trip, right? But this is one of hundreds of images Allah took um, from this day. So 
the excess of these images, the abundance of these images um, might also be understood as a kind of subversion of surveillance technology, as a kind of counter surveillance, because by producing so many visual documents that are so mundane and unremarkable, by making himself hyper visible, Allah, actually finds a way to camouflage himself in an excess of data. And we could also think about Allahi's project as a kind of critique of social media and, and a critique of the way that we're so eager to overshare, right? To um, post all kinds of personal details um, with the general public on the web. But by turning the act of surveillance inward, Allahi draws our attention to the banality of surveillance and the ways that we've normalized and become habituated to being surveilled. So as you can see with this kind of small um, little survey, uh, these artists all take very different approaches to thinking about and working with uh, photography and surveillance technology. But in one way or another, they're all using photographic images um, to turn the tables on the logic of surveillance technology and to try to explore the relationship between machine vision and human vision and suggest that machine vision and human vision are not so different as, as we often like to think of them. Um, that human vision is actually uh, working to inform the logics of machine vision. And I also think that these uh, artists offer important examples of how art can be used to creatively critique and explore and draw attention to, to, to make public these power dynamics and political issues that are really affecting us all. So I'm going to stop there and, um, and open things up if, uh, if you want to have a little Q&A or discussion.